welcome to Talking Bottom. I'm Ange Pearson. I'm Matt Brooks. And I'm Paul Tanter. We are thrilled to be joined today by a British writer and actor of immense calibre. In 1976, he graced British TV in the BBC's iconic adaptation of I, Claudius, and he was in the original 1977 version of Poldark. He's appeared in Doctor Who, A Bit of Fry and Laurie, Rab C. Nesbitt, Spooks, Midsummer Murders twice, and Life on Mars. He played the iconic Tony Hancock, re-recording lost episodes of Hancock's Half Hour, and in 2019 he encompassed the role of Captain Mannering in UK TV's Dad's Army, The Lost Episodes. He starred as Mr Gibbs in Pirates of the Caribbean, boasting a place as one of only three actors to star in every film in the franchise. Geoffrey Rush and some unknown called Johnny Depp, for anyone wondering. There's barely been a year that's passed in which our tellies or silver screens have been absent of his talent. More recently, he's been in Downton Abbey and The Crown. But to our listeners, his natural habitat is surrounded by leather gimp masks, dildos and nipple clamps in the seedy sex shop Richie and Eddie enter in search for pheromone sex spray. Kevin McNally, welcome and thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here talking bottom with us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi. Hi. Kevin, uh, you began your career aged 16 at the Birmingham Rep Theatre. So how did you know at such a young age that you wanted to become an actor? Well, um, I sort of knew it from the beginning, really. I, I, uh, I, I'd done school plays and things when I, uh, when I was very young, and I had done operettas at secondary school, and I, I really got the bug, and I really knew I wanted to do it. So I was very lucky in 1972. I, um, I wanted to join the National Youth Theatre, but um, I didn't come from a very wealthy background. So my family couldn't send me to London for um, the six weeks, you know, and live there to do that. But fortunately that year, a Birmingham Youth Theatre started. I lived in Birmingham and um, I was spotted in that. Uh, the director of the Birmingham Repertory Theatre needed a child actor or a, a young actor. and um, he offered me a job in the theatre. So that that's sort of how it all started, really. So who, who are your personal heroes growing up? Comedy heroes or other? Well, uh, definitely the two that I've played. I mean, Tony Hancock has always been my absolute favourite um, from my childhood. And, you know, I sort of grew up in my um, early teens watching uh, Dad's Army. And, of course, by the time I got into my mid-20s, that's really when, you know, what we refer to as alternative comedy, the young ones, Fry and Laurie, those people that, you know, they, they were the up and coming people. And I, I'll never forget, really, in, um, in about sort of 83, I thought this is all passing me by a bit. I'd really, really like to, um, to, to be involved in this comedy um, scene. And I made, a, I, I made a real effort to um, get my agent to be seen for these things. And within a very short space of time, I had appeared in The New Statesman, which is where I first met Rick, with Fry and Laurie and um, Joe Brand. So um, I, I managed to sort of elbow my way in, into the comedy world. Were you a fan of The Young Ones and Filthy Rich and Cat Flap? And, and uh, indeed of Rick and Abe's previous work as The Dangerous Brothers and that kind of thing? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And even before Rick and Aid, I, I, I had loved his character of Kevin Turvey because he reminded me of, of so many people who came, you know, came from where I came from. So you were with Rick on The New Statesman, but was Bottom the first time you'd worked with both Rick and Aid? Yes. Yeah, that was the, the first and only time I worked with them both. It was great, actually, because because I'd met uh, Rick and um, w we became good friends. And also our kids were the same age as well. So, you know, we, we sort of shared bringing, bringing them up. They went to the same school at certain times. And when Bottom came around, uh, they asked me to, to do Mr. Sex. And I do seem to remember uh, Rick saying to me, he said, it's a tiny role, but he said, but you'll be remembered for all eternity. Mm -hmm. And um, to a certain extent, he was absolutely right. And, and people still quote lines from the, from, the, from the one scene that I did at me. Yeah, we wanted to ask about that because yours is such a memorable character. I mean, you're in the first episode, of course. Um, yes. Which maybe helps that, but um, the sex shop scene is is so, so memorable. What line is it that, or lines do you get said to you the most then? I, I'd rather have a pineapple inserted inserted <laughs> violently into my rectum is the <laughs> one that they like the most. Is there anything I, I can help you, sir? With the, to, or is there anything you'd like to buy to help you with your sex life? That's another one. <laughs> 
I mean, I think he's got like. he's got such piss poor customer relations that that <laughs> sexual. He's so rude to the people yeah. who come into his shop. He, he really is. I mean, the idea of humiliating the character the people who come in. I mean, I do think Eddie and Rich do ask for it a little bit, but um, yeah, <laughs> because it was very funny for me because you know it's it's such a thing now. A bottom. But of course, I had no idea what to expect when I went in. And and looking back at it, I, I had a little look at it the other day. Um, it, it, it's remarkable how in that first episode, they come to the first episode completely formed with their characters. They obviously knew exactly what they wanted to do. Um, and it's a great episode. The other thing that was great about being in the first episode, I was uh, fortunate enough to be there but waiting to have a pint with both of them while they recorded the end title sequence, which was really thrilling. I think I seem to think they did two takes, um, and uh, the second one was just perfect on the one that they used. That's amazing. So you got so to you, watch they... them do the silhouetted. It, yeah, I watched them. In fact, um, I think it was, was Ed By who directed. It, I think mm-hmm. um, he put me. By, he said, watch this, he said, um, because it was sort of like cutting edge technology at the time. He said, you can watch the guys do it, but watch the effect I'm doing. And um, and I was sort of blown away by this wonderful sort of balletic shadow dance that that it, that it turned into. It's sort of a, it's a great fond memory for me, really. So as a viewer, um, it was so memorable to see those those titles go up for the first time. Like even yeah. the end credits, there was so much energy and jokes going on in in the yeah. final thing. Yeah. Did you uh, come to do the role through? Just it was just a straight offer. You'd worked with Rick before, and he said, "I've got something good for you." And he sends you, sends you the script, and you see the the character name is Mister Sex. That must uh, that must have had you, you know, it was, sort it's of intriguing. It was intriguing. I mean, he didn't do it personally, but he asked he asked um, the producers. You know, he said, I, "I know, I think Kevin should do this part," and. Um, and, and I think, you know, I we probably had to persuade uh, uh, Aid because I had not met Aid at that point. But, you know, he trusted uh, he trusted Rick's um, comic chops. And, um, I, you know, I, and I sort of thought at the time I, I was a bit nervous, really, because they, they were both comic icons to me. And uh, I know I'd have to up my game a bit. And I was quite surprised. When I got the script, I, I really thought I'd be some sort of stooge for them. But the fact that he had funny lines as well was just excellent. Mm-hmm. The, the only thing I regret is that they never thought of bringing Mr. Sex back, um, <laughs> you know, which is a damn shame. It yeah, is. Yeah. It is. It would have been great because I imagine they would have re- frequented that sex shop. Uh, <laughs> I think. I mean, there were all sorts of props in there. We could have had a great time with. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask: Is was there any that you got to take away after? Because that set is so so, <laughs> so well stocked. No, um, it didn't. I was I was so busy concentrating on the work. It, it didn't cross my mind to start nicking the props. No. Oh, no. fair enough. I, I don't know what what prop I could be thinking of that I'd have taken home. Um, <laughs> But you know, maybe, maybe. Well, I can think of one, but it's not my place to say. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Only because Rick touched it, of course. (laughs) Yes, of course. So, what was the kind of the direction and notes stuff that Rick Aid and Ed By gave you for this character? Well, first of all, we must say, remember, this is thirty years ago. So, Mm -hmm. the memorable bits stand out. The actual sort of day to day. I was trying to think in preparation to talking to you about rehearsals but I, I mean I can't remember rehearsing it I can remember going into the studio and being on the you know on the studio floor and, and being quite nervous waiting for the scene in front of a live audience but I it, it was sort of, as I remember it was sort of obvious to me what he was going to be like and I, I put in an earring and slip my hair back and get you know I, I asked for dark clothes you know that he'd be a bit you know, I, I I sort of had that image, and and everyone just seemed to think that was okay, and um, go ahead. They're very trusting, really. Brilliant, because we thought that it must have been the costume department that would have influenced that, but you actually came to it with the notes of of what you wanted to be. Really well, um, you know, I, I we, we probably were all on the same page, but mm. I did have a sort of an image of you know, sort of quite a, a slicked back, sort of greasy, self confident. <laughs> guy you know and it, and it was there in the writing you know mm. because what you have to when you look back I mean the writing is just brilliant it's so consistently funny all the time in fact uh, what I want to do um this evening is I was talking to somebody about this um 
at, at a wedding I went to the other day and somebody was talking about a bottom and um, the one I really want to watch again because I've only seen it a couple of times and of course it is absolutely genius is them stuck on the Ferris wheel that's about yeah. to get about to get um, destroyed I, and I remember seeing that and going what an extraordinary brave thing to do to just put your two characters stuck mm. up you know, a thousand feet up in the air. I mean, it's just yeah. uh, brutal. And I love the one on uh, Wimbledon Common as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. That, uh, two handers. So I think they're my favourite ones as well. It's just those two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> The Ferris wheel one is very unique as well because it all takes place in real time. So it's just you know it, it starts and then it just runs all the way through to the end. There's no there's no like yeah cuts for, for twenty five minutes. Yeah, it's extraordinary, yeah, yeah. absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, obviously, it's easy to kind of look back retrospectively um, at these kind of things. But did you have an idea at the time when you were doing it? Obviously, Rick and Aid had a good track record of sitcoms from the Young Ones uh, and other and New Statesman and other things. When you were doing it, did you have any idea or sense of, oh, I think this could be something very special? I, I, I did because it was the atmosphere of the first recording. I mean, I think, you know, as far as Aid and Rick working together, the Filthy Rich and Catflap wasn't that successful. And, uh, and they sort of went off and did their own thing for a while. So it, people were really looking forward to them coming back together again. And um, there was an atmosphere the night we recorded it and the, and the audience just really, really went for it. And I thought, this is a runner and this is really, really going to go. And um, I mean, it's, it's interesting that uh, I don't know how long they did it for, but, you know, with the stage shows and everything, it, it just became part of the sort of national identity, really, didn't it? Mm, yeah, their characters very much uh, became part of the national identity as well. I mean, uh, they're sort of yeah. they're unique in the world of sitcom in that they are fairly sort of grotesque and perverse characters, uh, which you don't tend to get in, <laughs> in primetime BBC sitcoms. Um, no uh, and you know and the question we all ask is you know w would it even be done today you know um I, I think it's highly unlikely but of course they they had forged the way in in unpleasant and and, and grotesque characters with, with the young ones and with the dangerous brothers of course but i, I tell you what I, I i also feel looking at it is that in that sort of decade from the time they'd done the, the, well, it's actually less than a decade, from the time they had done The Young Ones to the time that they did Bottom, they were, at the, at the time they started Bottom, they were masters of their craft by then. That there was a little, it, it was all a, a little loose in um, uh, The Young Ones. I mean, it was brilliant and wonderful and you know, absolutely uh, changed the face of comedy. But they were such masters. I, I'm thinking of things, wonderful things like, Eddie trying to bring himself to look at, um, at, at Rick's thong, you know, when he's lost his thong. <laughs> and that, that thing he does of, of, of looking away and trying to look, I mean, it's, yeah. and it goes on for ages. And it's just, it's a piece of comic masterpiece. It really is. They were just absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And who yeah. has, you know, got drunk and worn their underpants up above those shirts, you know. <laughs> you were very much a fan of the rest of the shows then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I was. I mean, we still are. My son, of course, who, who knew Rick well, he has um, a whole collection of DVDs all signed by Rick. I mean, we were just real fanboys of the show, and he was a bit too young to have ever seen them live. But he's my son. I mean, wasn't really a thing to take a, a young lad to. And, and I think they probably the shows had finished by the time he was old enough to yeah. sort of go to a theatre. But um, he's got all those uh, live shows as well, and we watch we watch them regularly. Yeah. How did he react when he found out you were in this show? I mean, did you show it to him and say, "By the oh, way, I'm in one"? I don't know about that. I think he knew mm. fr from the beginning that I knew Rick, and Rick yeah. was you know, was a part of our lives. And in fact, my son was at the male's house just the um, the other day because he's been great friends with them. Rick's kids, of course, still to this day. And uh, so I think he just always knew that I was Mr. Sex. You know, I mean, it was just, it was something he grew up knowing. It was, I don't think there was any particular moment when he found out. Yeah, I yeah. love that idea that, you know, it's like, oh, dad, but you don't work in a sex shop. Like, okay. <laughs> no, no, I don't think he had any delusions that I actually worked in a sex shop. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I, in fact, I dread to think of how, how young he was when I first showed him. <laughs> I mean, we God. were all very it was young. bad parenting. 
Yeah. Huh? It's good parenting. It's good parenting. Is it good? Definitely. Good. Thank you. I'm. Uh, thank you for the support. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was eight when I first watched Bottom. Um, oh, really? It definitely well, definitely made me a better person. Yeah, yeah. I think. <laughs> that, yeah. I, I'll have to ask um, David later when you first saw Bottom. I, it'll probably really shock me the answer. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably really younger really than eight. Up. The really real yeah. stuff goes over your head when you're that young. But um, I think, so, yeah, um, and and you know, it's um, it's, it is rude, but it's harmless rude, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you it's mentioned good. that you it is good rude, exactly. Mm. You mentioned that you were um, a bit nervous prior to your performance. But we've actually heard previously that Rick would get quite nervous before um, performing. Did you were you aware of that at the time when you were filming at Smells or? He did. I know. I remember it more from the N New Statesman, actually, because um, I remember I went and did my first scene with him in the New Statesman mm. and he was quite nervous. And I, I was actually um, I don't show my nerves very much. And I went in and I did quite a good first take. And he did look at me and he go, oh, cool as a cucumber, Mr. McNally, he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and famously, of course, the just the energy you put in and directing that that nervousness that nervous energy he had is what made him have to change his costume every every other scene because um he would literally be drenched in sweat um <laughs> just with the sheer effort of, of performing and and directing that energy and one of the intimidating things of course of doing bottom was just the energy of the two of them you know uh, to 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 a straight actor uh, you think, Jesus Christ, was <laughs> save save a bit for the end, you know. But they started at 150 miles an hour and they ended at 175, you know. Did you ever find yourself in danger of corpsing at any point when you were in the scene with them? I'm thinking well, specifically when Rick grabs the dildo. Yes, I, of course. And in fact, the end of the scene, I do laugh because I think Rick did, did something incredibly rude in the doorway. And I did say to the, the director, I said, um, I really laughed at the end of that. And he said... Well, he said, I, I, yeah, I did get that and I might use it because I think you're just laughing at how stupid they are. And I said, <laughs> but you know that I wasn't. I was laughing at Rick being rude. And he went, yeah, but the audience it worked. Don't, you know. <laughs> so it's one of those it's one of those corpses that stayed in in the episode. Yeah. Yeah, there, you do. You laugh, don't you? At, um, Rick yeah. Playing with the with the whatever the hell that device is that he grabs on the way out. The yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is that? It's just it looks like a bunch of like tape or something. It's just some sort of suspenders, some leather gear. <laughs> uh, it's, it's some kind of, yeah, sort of body strap or something, I think it was. I always thought it was... It, 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 have you ever seen the, the film Anvil? No. Anvil, the, the story of Anvil? Yeah. Yes. I think it's what that singer used to wear, you know, the, the leather <laughs> cross thing. I think it's one of those, because he, he was into wearing bondage wear. So it was that, you know, usual sort of stuff they tell yeah. me I yeah, that show that, that have, show yeah. yeah i mean that's quite early on in that film you get a unsolicited nude of the man just pop up on screen like oh oh okay yeah it's, it's a good documentary watch it oh it's great it's a great <laughs> documentary i mean it's, it's sad and difficult but yeah yeah really good you have such a great wry smile throughout the scene with richie and eddie and their adolescent embarrassment in the sex shop have you got any memories of similar escapades in your own youth entering such establishments? Um, <laughs> that is a leading question. I, I do remember um, the first time at drama school, me and my girlfriend venturing into a sex shop. And of course, um, I always found it um, hideously embarrassing. I mean, I, I you know, I, I've just hated it, I remember. And I suppose I thought back to doing that when I played Mr. Sex, because I remember that the that when we went into this uh, this shop, I think it was to, <laughs> I don't know how much I should say of this, but I think it was to get, there, was a, there were tablets called Taurus that were just complete rip-off that was supposed to give a man longevity. Mm -hmm. And I was a very young man at the time. And um, I, I remember that the, the man in the shop did absolutely nothing to put me at my ease <laughs> and sort of had a sort of a smile of like, I know what your bloody problem is. Yeah. And I thought, I thought, well, I, I think I might use, uh, you know, that he's just, the man's an ass, really. Yeah. I mean, Mr. Sex is an ass. Yeah, it's so well observed. 
that mm, um, yeah. that character of, of someone who's obviously completely unembarrassed because he's working in this shop and yeah, he works these there, people yeah. all the time and that's just mm. you know that's his uh, you know bread and butter as it were and um, for these yes. like adolescents to come in feeling you know really really intimidated um, but then of course Richie pretends he's not um, and that's where the humor comes from it's yes but, but I, I the, the line I couldn't ever they couldn't put the camera on me when he said it was um we are men of science yeah. <laughs> i just <laughs> love that and also the, I, I love aid's thing about um uh, so this is a sex shop is it i love 10 quids worth or whatever yeah. <laughs> he said you know, I think I've never, heard that, never heard that one before yeah yeah never heard that one before <laughs> And then the and then with the retort to the pineapple inserted violently into your rectum and, and AIDS yeah. perfect. You've been working yeah. here too been long. Been here then. too long, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. I'm gonna have to watch it again tonight. I really am. <laughs> I'm gonna have to have a bottom marathon. Were you aware that Bottom's inspiration was partly due to Rick and Aid appearing in Waiting for Godot? They did the show, I think, around the same time they did the first series of Bottom. And there's often they sort of did, yes. I remember when they did it with um with Christopher, Christopher Ryan. Ryan. With Christopher Ryan, yeah, yeah. Do you see I, similarities I, and comparisons? Yes, I think there is. There's a lot of slapstick in, in Godot, isn't there? Um, I hadn't really thought about that, but yes, they are contemporaneous, the, 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 the stage show and, and the first uh, the first bottom. So I can see that now, but I wasn't aware of that at the time, no. Did you get a chance to see them perform, perform the show? Uh, I didn't because I was on stage at the same time, so I ne ah. I'd never got to see them do Waiting Butter, which is, uh, I, I would love to have seen it. I really would have. Yeah, it's the, it's the thing I'm going to do when I when they crack time travel. That's what I'm going to go. Is it really? Gonna go <laughs> see. It's, it's my biggest oh. thing I, I missed well, out it, on. When they crack time travel, um, if they crack it in time for me, do give us a call and I'll come with you. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll all go. Book a couple of tickets, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you're in a scene with one of the most visual knob gags ever committed to, to TV, yes. maybe. Do you think Bottom gets a bit of an unfair reputation as being predominantly toilet humour when it's writing things so clever beyond just knob gags? It, yeah, yes. It, if that's the case, <clears throat> that it has that reputation. I mean, you know, knob gags and rude gags are obviously a, a, a part of it, but there is, there's so much more than that. I mean, it's such a great uh, sort of... The, as as I was talking about Aid's reaction to the thong, you know, there's there's <clears throat> real comic mastery in it, and th th they were prolific writers. I mean, if you think about those, what is it, eighteen episodes, written in quite a short mm. space of time, and then the then then the three is it three stage shows? Five. Is it five? Was it five stage shows? Well, and a feature film. Uh, uh, oh, uh, the hotel. What was it called? Oh, Guest House Paradiso. Guest House Paradiso. Yeah. Um, just prolific. I mean, absolutely mm -hmm. prolific. But of course, you know, they, they were men of my generation and we grew up on knob gags, you know. So um, <laughs> why, why would you not, when you become a very famous comedian, use your, your best knob gags, you know? What do you think the secret to the show's success was and made it unique? Do you think it was the cartoon violence, the slapstick or the, the nihilism that sort of pervaded it? Well, apart from that, it was tremendously well written and was genuinely very funny. I think uh, it, they were continuing what they did with the young, or, or well, although they didn't write the young ones, but um, they were continuing the notion of uh, anarchic humour and uh, grotesquery and uh, slapstick. I mean, they, they, you know, they they just allowed themselves to take whatever they wanted to put into it you know there was no question of uh, style or taste it sort of developed its own style and lack of taste uh, for itself and and is and is um beautiful because of that and i know that you know I, it, people of my son's generation they uh, they adore the show they, they weren't born when i recorded that uh, that first episode but i know that you know he they they talk about bottom all the time and and in a way as humor changes i think a lot of young people go well why why can't we have this you know mm -hmm. because i think in a sort of a way television comedy anyway uh, sort of short changes them a little bit and that's why they discover people who they love <coughs> on the internet more now than they would you know on mainstream television so it doesn't surprise you that 30 years later it's still celebrated and people still ask you about it and so forth no not at all not at all um and it's it's a little bit like um 
I always say about music, you know, um, when I find myself complaining about maybe modern music, um, uh, my retort is always, yes, I know that the older generation have always said that modern music is crap, but we happen to be the first generation who are right. And I feel the same thing. I feel the same thing about about comedy. I mean, there's a lot of very anodyne comedy. about. There's a lot of really good comedy as well. But there was a sense there in the early 90s with Bottom that... Um, there was, there was nothing that they couldn't do. It was uh, just brilliant, I think. Yeah. So free and released and confident and, and to use that word, funny. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see the first drafts of the script for that particular episode? Did you ever see an earlier draft? And the reason I ask this is because you got I, it. <laughs> I have Rick Mail's first draft script here. Oh, wow. Which, actually, I, I acquired this uh, a while ago in which... I don't know if you knew this. So if you knew this, if you don't know this, I'm quite pleased to be able to inform you of this. But Mr. Yeah. Sachs actually in the first draft appeared in the final scene. So the episode goes, they visit they visit Mr. Sex in the sex shop. Then they go home, spray on the stuff. Then they go to the pub and they strike out with the women who they think are lesbians. And yeah. originally they go to the toilet and um, Mr. Sex comes out and sees them and makes a, a wry comment in the toilet, goes into the pub. And then after they get turned down by the lesbians, Mr. Sex, uh, calling back to his line earlier, says, it must be fantastic to have such a rich and varied sex life. Rich and Eddie look at each other and then both punch Mr. Sex in the face. And that was that was going to freeze frame and be the end of the episode. <laughs> Why do you think you? I'd be happy to hear that? Why did you say <laughs> that thing? I was just thinking I'm, that. I'm furious now. I'm furious. Uh, no, I never, I never saw that draft. Okay. Though. <laughs> um, I, I can't imagine why they didn't want to punch Mr. Sex in the face. <laughs> I think usually that the endings were, they had a sort of theme of the ending usually was one of them begetting violence upon the other one. So rather than be, them hitting another one of the characters, it was usually right. They, they, yeah, they said about themselves. Yeah. No, that's just like a victory in a way if they've hit you, I suppose, instead of a failure. Yes. I, they I mean, it's probably, it's probably too, successful an ending for them yeah yeah i no, i can I, I can sort of see why they would have taken uh, that out mm. um but we would have loved to have seen mr think sex think return I'm twice as famous today as i am it would be <laughs> i'd be asked twice as many questions did they actually hit you mr mcnally yeah they did yeah <laughs> Well, let's have a spin-off of just Mr. Sex. Why not? Like, you know, I know. Get it written. Um, um, why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, people can't see me now, but I'm sure they've seen me on the television. I, I don't. I probably don't look quite as as racy as I did when I was in my thirties. <laughs> <laughs> but but I could, you know, I could be old, Mr. Sex, couldn't I? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and of course, in 2016, you had big boots to fill when you starred as Tony Hancock in the lost sitcoms and you re-recorded lots yeah. of episodes of that um the new neighbor was the one that was obviously done for tv along tv yeah john culshaw as sid james how was it performing scripts by galton and simpson the legends um well fantastic because <clears throat> i always um loved uh, uh hancock and in the 70s i suppose um it, there was a bit of a dearth. We had a few records we could listen to. They weren't repeated because they were in black and white. Mm -hmm. um, I had all the EPs and records. And it was in 1980 that my very good friend, Mel Smith, mm -hmm. called me up. And he said, come on over. I've got, I've got, I've got a surprise for you. Mm -hmm. And he apparently, um, don't quote me on this, but apparently so him and a friend or, or somebody had raided the BBC archives and quickly recorded some some um uh, tony hancock episodes it was sort of bootlegged tony hancock and we went and i and i watched them for the first time since the mid 60s and um god that was that was thrilling and of course then you know they were released on vhs and then on dvd and then you know the, the, all things hancock you can you can find it everywhere now so i i'd had plenty of time like 25 years to really immerse myself again in the man. And interestingly enough, when I got offered Hancock, I had been trying to make a movie about him for many years and it didn't work out. And when I got offered to step in and do the last episodes, I realized, well, that was much better. I didn't really want to do the tears behind the clown and the alcoholic and the, the sad man and the suicide. I wanted to do him at his absolute finest when he was one of the greatest comedians 
uh, ever on radio and television. Fantastic. Did you? Quite a history, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And Galton and Simpson, of course, you know, produced Hancock's Half Hour and Steptoe and Son. Uh, yeah. Incre- like just and I was, very, themselves. I was um, very lucky that when we first started recording the radio show, um, Ray and Alan were, were very much still with us and, and, and very compos mentis. And uh, I, 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 I went to them on the first recording and uh, they, um, I know that Alan said to me, he said, he said that's a, a a very wonderful homage to a great comedian by a young man. He oh. said, I was probably just turning 60 at the time. <laughs> and um, and I begged them and they did do it for me. And we recreated a photograph of them and Tony Hancock, which is one of my most treasured images, of course, now that they're gone. Yeah. How wonderful. I mean, I mm. just previously joked that him and Rick ripped off Galton and Simpson when they were writing Bottom. Did you ever chat to Rick or, or Aid about their respect for for the great partnership that Galton and Simpson had been? I can't remember um, <coughs> ever particularly talking about that. I know that um, I know that Rick was a fan of Hancock. Um, I, we both shared that because Hancock and me and Rick are all from the same part of the country. We're all Midlanders, so we share a, a great a shared a great sense of. Um, a great middle and sense of humour, you know. So um, we, we obviously did talk about Hancock, but whether or not, I can't ever remember discussing Galton and Simpson with them. Um, well, Hancock then, what what sort of, that was a definite influence on Rick? I think so. I mean, it, Rick was a little younger than me, um, but um, he was obviously very aware of him. And uh, we, um, I seem to remember one, a couple of nights, Rick, and I went to Mel Smith's house and we would watch like comedy films. And I think one night we did have a bit of a, a Hancock uh, marathon, which was uh, very, very interesting, very funny to be sitting with two, you know, truly great comedians and a wonderful memory for me now that, you know, sadly they're both gone. So a wonderful memory for me to, to, to remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the brilliant thing, though. Obviously, you know, comedy it brings people together and, you know, even, you know. Yeah amazing people like Rick and Mel and you know yourself getting together watching that your idols you know that that that's what comedy yeah gives, it, I mean it, through time? It, is, it is like that isn't it it's like comedy passes down like a baton through generations and um you know and that's why I'm particularly thrilled that you know my son is mid-20s that that generation they all still love uh they're not necessarily they're far as back as Hancock but certainly the what Hancock was to me Mm. I think Rick and Aid are to a younger generation now. They're the great comedians oh, of their absolutely free, free life and childhood. So um, it, it's sort of lovely to see that happening again. Mm. And uh, I hope that the next generation will have something of similar stature. Yeah, I, and if not, that we just keep passing on down bottom. And, and I mean, I, I step toe and son for me as well. I absolutely love reading. Oh, absolutely, them. absolutely. I, I, that was and my dad showing and me that. Dad's army, you know, which is mm. which has never never stopped being shown on the television. I don't think since 1969 when it started. It's mm-hmm. extraordinary success, really. Yeah. Dad's, Dad's army and step toe and bottom all uh, seem to have class as quite an important theme running through them. Do you think that's that? that class is an important concept for, for UK comedy? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And the interesting the interesting thing is that I notice about the difference between um, American comedy, for instance, and um, and British comedy. Uh, Steptoe and Son is a, a, a point in case. The American version, Stanford and Son, of course, the Son is a really nice and decent bloke because the Americans couldn't stand to have two horrible people in the, uh, as as leads you know so american humor is aspirational in the sense of people achieve their aspirations and um, um, english humor is aspirational in, in that they resolutely fail to achieve anything and if you think of you know uh, uh, rick and aiden bottom if you think of basil faulty david brent these characters are all uh, people with ideas above their station and there are abject failures in life and that's what we find funny, you know. That's what we Brits find funny. People get um, above themselves. <laughs> and you've uh, you've embodied some of these classic characters yourself. So you played Tony Hancock, and you played yeah. Captain Mannering in yeah. both of these performing Lost episodes. If mm. are there any other classic comedy characters that you'd like to uh, fill the shoes of? Well, interesting enough, when, when they came to me for Hancock, I I went great. I can do that. 
I, I felt very confident about that because I felt immersed. There's a very funny story. Um, well, when Neil Pearson, who, who created the Lost Hancocks, went to the BBC with this idea, they said, well, we'll do it only on one condition is that you find, you have to find a great Hancock, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he thought, oh, God, this is going to be a long process. But that night he went to a dinner party and Andy Hamilton was there and he told him his problem. And Andy said, uh, he said, problem solved. It said, uh, Kevin McNally is the man you want. It's hard to stop him doing it, even when he's not playing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so <laughs> uh, that was great. However, when they came to with, with Mannering, I thought, why on earth would anybody want me to play Captain Mannering? I didn't see myself as that character at all. But I, I said, give me a week. And I, and I, you know, immersed myself in videos and stuff. And I, I found I had a Hancock. I think it's highly unlikely I'll, I'll have a third great comedy character i can impersonate okay, uh, okay. in me if ever if ever they want to do um love thy neighbor again i could do a bit of a jack smethurst i think but yeah. i think it's highly unlikely that that show will ever see the light of day again <laughs> very true um and what about um you've also played in your career you've played kenneth clark you've played bernard ingham and you played harold wilson is there, yeah. are there any other politicians or people in the in the world of politics that you'd like to play no, I, I loved playing uh, Ken Clark, and I loved uh, doing it. Again, you see, this uh, um, Harold Wilson was just such a joy because I had been turned down, believe it or not, to play him on stage in the audience with Helen Mirren as, as, uh, as um, Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe that they turned me down. My, my uh, Im imitation was so good um, but th then again th it's from my childhood you see it's from exactly the same time that I was watching that man Harold Wilson was exactly the same time that I was watching um, uh, Tony Hancock so I, I don't really feel any warmth towards mm. any other politician yeah. that I want to play really yeah. uh, I I'd have a stab at Jacob Brees Mog, uh, Mog if, 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 if I was forced to but I'd, um, I'd have a stab at him yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, when, yeah, I didn't mean performing. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. When you are playing a real life person or someone who's been played before, how do you approach the performance? Well, I've talked about this a lot with Kevin Eldon because, you know, he did a brilliant job, um, as, as they all did, but particularly him, I thought, playing Clive Dunn. He was, uh, uh, I, I, saw an, I saw an outtake where, he, where you, you said, I'm sorry, I was too busy laughing at, at I think it was his entrance or something, but you were too busy, you, you were sort of caught up almost like I, I completely I, it was I think it was the first time we'd interacted as the characters and I I just couldn't go on it was just so funny but we rather disagreed about it because I, I, I remember I was asked this and I said I suppose particularly when you're playing because it's quite a hybrid thing you're playing an actor who's playing a part that they were famous for so you, I'm not playing Captain Mannering or I'm not playing Anthony Aloysius Hancock I'm playing Arthur Lowe playing Mannering and I'm playing Tony Hancock playing Anthony Aloysius Hancock. So I said, it's just shy of a slavish impression to which Kevin said, now I go for the slavish impression myself. <laughs> uh, and in, indeed, I think he's probably right. I think you just have to immerse yourself. One of the tricky parts of it is though, it sort of divides your brain a little bit because on the one hand, you're responding to the other actors as you would with a character that you'd created. But a half of your brain is trying to do that via channeling this other actor doing it. Because if you drift away from that, people wouldn't enjoy it nearly half as much, I think. So yeah. it's, quite, it's quite a sort of a hybrid sort of process, really. Mm. Well, so, I, thought, I, I, thought you did, I thought you did a, a terrific job in both of them. So, uh, Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So you've written uh, a fair bit. You've written episodes of Boone, Minder and the TV mm. series Lockstock. Um, are you yes. still writing? Uh, and is there anything... No. No, okay. um, um, I, and I'll tell you exactly for why. Back when I was writing with my, part, uh, with my partner, Bernard Dempsey, we would meet up with the producers of any of those shows and we would go to the pub and have a drink and we'd sit around and then one of us would say, um, oh, I know, Arthur has a row with Dave the barman because of something that happened in their past. And they'd go, great. And we'd go away and we'd come and we'd turn up with the script and they would go terrific to change this this and this and then they would film it during the course of our career as writers in the late 80s and i suppose up to about 2000 i think lockstock was it became television by committee and so you know if you wanted to put an idea forward for television you first of all wrote a document about what it was about and then you wrote 
a thing describing each scene and then you wrote the scenes and um and then usually it wouldn't get made and you wouldn't get paid so um it became it became what what was a joy the life and pleasure was sucked out of it by bureaucracy um particularly um you know at the at the, the channels the ITV and BBC so um no i i gave it up really i i, I thought life's too short for this Shame okay. to hear that, though, Kevin. It's, it's such a shame to hear that. Is why presumably it, a lot of creativity is getting stunted. I think so. Um, in fact, you know, I was talking about being at this wedding and talking about Bottom the other night. The guy I was talking to was a, a rather famous television writer who I met when he wrote this TV film, um, this wonderful TV film that he, uh, he cast me in. And um, he now writes episodic television, and he says. Um, you know, I, I I do this because I have to make a living, but I I can't I can no longer go to somebody at the channel and say, can I make a film about you know this idea? I've just got this idea that, because it, that people won't go for it, you know. So th that's sort of a shame. I mean, I, th I there's a balance really because obviously with so much content and streaming, there is a lot done, but there has been a move. To, uh, towards you know big, big epic fantasy you know and, and and that has its place it's great but um it there's, there's certainly in um british television there's not a lot of room for um telling people's stories anymore really and the, the, there's the, there is a sort of a formulaic approach i think to writing television which um i think has sucked some of the life out of it but it, it's not all gloom and doom i mean you know, there's some fantastic stuff out there. What there's British just so, comedy and there's a are you lot watching of... at the moment? Have you or have seen in recent years that you've been? Um, I haven't actually. I haven't been. I, I'm when lockdown happened. Um, I saw it as a great opportunity to just go back and watch all the famous films, uh, oh, my favourite films from my life. So I've got, I've got rather, I've got rather attached to black and white movies from the forties and fifties <laughs> at the moment. So. Yeah, I, I'm watching a lot of lot of movies. I don't really watch a lot of television. Do you watch? Um, are you a fan of old um, slapstick stuff like Laurel and Hardy and Buster Keaton? Oh, Laurel and Hardy, Buster Keaton, absolutely, my absolute favourites, and uh, and both of them well above Chaplin for me. I mean, Keaton is just fantastic, and it's rather interesting actually, as I hear myself sort of whinging about <laughs> how the world has changed. Of course, they all went through that as well. They were all, um, you know, eaten up by the studio system and, and put into into vehicles that did very well, but you know, was not their best work. Um, mm. Particularly think about Laurel and Hardy when they <clears throat> they went on to do those later feature films um, with MGM, I think, and uh, and MGM sucked up uh, Buster Keaton and. and he no longer had control over his his work, so it probably just happens to every generation, you know. And the next generation um, get used to working in that system, and then it changes on them, you know. Well, so it's it's probably just an old an old whinge by an old actor. Well, also I think it's interesting that in terms of when we when I think of modern slapstick, apart from Mr. Bean, the only thing that really comes to mind is actually the work of Rick and Aid. So from the Dangerous Brothers through the Young Ones through Filthy Rich, and then into Bottom. Not yes, really you're, you're, you're probably right, aren't you? I mean, because the sort of um, humour of the 21st century, I suppose, as as events best by the office. I, I, I sort of would you say that the, the, the 21st century seemed to be the the the, um, the comedy of embarrassment. It's, it's the comedy of embarrassment and the comedy of the sharp comeback. I think it's all. You yes. Know, it, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, you're right. I mean, I can't think of a lot of physical comedy around out there at the moment, which is. Something of a shame. I know oh, I did a, a yeah. I did a, a, a sitcom with um, that wasn't particularly su successful with George Cole called Dad in the the nineties, and I I tried to do as much physical comedy as I as I could in it, but I just don't think it was very fashionable at, at mm. that point. Yeah, it's gone out of fashion for sure. There's more of a kind of you know, yeah. hyper real, like you say, David Brent, you know, Alan Partridge, you know, mm. and, which, which is great. Move into real characters I, that you could, you know, put yeah. in your situation rather suppose, than exaggerated. You know, I suppose to, to whinge a bit more about <laughs> about the modern world, it's horrible. <laughs> that I, I think one of the problems that happens is there's not a room for everything. You know, I don't know why things get very singular. You know, the, you, you look at movies. When I started making the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, we would, you know, we'd make them and we'd finish and then 
three months later, which is a very short uh, post-production time, it would come out on Labor Day on Memorial Day in America. When mm -hmm. we did the last one, we had to wait three years for there to be a weekend in which there wasn't a Marvel film uh, <laughs> being tent-pegged. Yeah. You know, so everything, everything is a bloody big tent peg uh, um, franchise movie now. You know, it's like it, people get very singular about what they want to watch or, or rather the studios get very singular about what they want to put out. And I, I, I liked it a bit more when there was more variety in, in what you could you could see. You mentioned the sitcom Dad there. Um, I wonder mm. what, what was it like playing opposite George Cole? Oh, wonderful, because he was just a master. I, I knew George pretty well because I'd written for him uh, on, on Minder, and he had very much enjoyed our scripts, and he, he really uh, was very keen on them, was very complimentary about them. So when I, we got to work together, we, you know, we did have a history. We, we talked about comedy a lot. It was rather interesting, actually. It was maybe seeing the beginning of the device of, of certainly the BBC, that they made us, well, I, I didn't so much mind me, but I, I, I sort of couldn't believe that they did it to George Cole. They made George read with me for, um, for dad. I mean, really? Uh, and I was, and I said to him, he came out, I said, I just think that's appalling. They've made you read for this part. You're George fucking Cole, for heaven's sake, you know? Mm. And he went, oh, well, it's just the way it's going now, you know? I mean, the, the, there are too the, there are too many people uh, part of the decision making process, you know. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you know, the BBC are putting out some excellent comedy still. Daisy Haggard's Back to Life um, is a recommendation I give to you. Aid Edmondson's just been in that, but apparently, what's that it called? Came Back to Life. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm. I, that's that's on. That is on my um, watch list. Yeah, yeah. Because Aid apparently, <laughs> according to his tweet, he he wrote to Daisy to commend the work for the first series, and then she said, you know, do you want to be in the next series? You know. So there is hopefully still a chance for people to <laughs> to kind of get in. But isn't that crazy that you know? Yeah. Well, um, maybe I should drop her a line myself. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, is there anyone <laughs> in particular that you would love to work with, and maybe you know they'll listen to this podcast and we can hook you up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, maybe she'd like to um, bring back Mr. Sex. That would be nice. Oh, that'd be great. The Mr. Yeah. Sex show by Daisy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you've worked on uh, an incredibly long list of uh, British TV shows. Are there any mm -hmm. shows or films that you missed out on narrowly or that you wish you were part of? Yes, I mean, many. Uh, absolutely many. Well, I, I, and I sort of keep a little bit of tally in my head going. But fortunately, most of the things I missed out on didn't do very well so that there's not there's not a big thing in my background of something saying you know if i'd have got that my life would have been different unfortunately being you know being a, a working character actor people often say to me what's your favorite what's your favorite job and i'm very lucky enough to be able to say my next one that's my favorite job <laughs> so yeah, there's no point sort of sitting around going what could have been i mean I, i've turned a few things down in the past and and i i have to say touch wood to this day i, I was probably really correct to do to do all the turning down but there, you know there were parts along the way that uh, you know i wish that i had got do you have a preference between theater and film i know because obviously you're a very accomplished theater actor as well you played king yes you cast the 300 cinemas playing king lear at the globe and you played claudius uh in Hamlet. Um, on broadway yeah um i i think like every actor when i'm on the stage i'm thinking oh god wouldn't it be great to be in the caribbean sitting in my trailer and filming for five minutes a day and then as soon as you get there you think oh, i'd love to be back on the stage you know in complete control of my performance so i mean i don't think we as, as a as a group of people are ever satisfied i have to say though <clears throat> you mentioned king lear um that was such an amazing experience that i i, I have i haven't been on stage since then. it's 2017 it would have to be something blooming marvelous to get me back on the stage again uh it, it's it's very hard work particularly as you get older and uh the idea of going and doing something for a long time that you weren't 100 percent behind is not um is not something i'd want to do i actually am working with guy jenkin and philip pope at the moment for something they've written that i might i, I might be tempted to come out of theatrical retirement to do but uh, we'll see how that goes really if we can get anybody interested in it in terms of uh, screen work uh, what are you working on at the moment or, or what have you got coming up that you'd like to share with people bit superstitious but uh just before i left chicago last week uh, obviously since the pandemic i i haven't worked on american television uh very much which i um i really like doing but i i, I did uh 
talked to some people on Zoom about doing uh, an episode of a, of a new uh, Amazon series playing the leading character's father. And so I would really like to do that again because I um, it's filming in New York and I love doing that. And it really appeals to the child in me, you know, um, when I used to watch films set in New York and it was all so glamorous. But having said that, I've probably completely jinxed it now. So <laughs> Not said what it is, so... Okay, tell you what, we'll cut this bit. We'll cut this bit. <laughs> yeah. No, but I've said it. It doesn't matter whether you cut yeah. it or not. I've said it. Now. <laughs> yeah. I live not. You can always reprise Mr. Sex. Hey, we'll, uh, yes, exactly. we'll make that yeah. happen. <laughs> uh, but apart from that, um, I, I am. Uh, I, I've got a few surprises coming up at the end of the year. A few things I've done. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, well, but I'm not today because um, you have to sign all these non disclosure yeah. mm. It's just. They take themselves far too seriously, you know, nowadays in television. Well, I'm glad that you began in, in you know, obviously like in the earlier days and you can tell us that your wealth of experience. It's been a pleasure chatting to you, Kevin, about everything. Um, well, it's we been could have talked for so much people. longer. There's so much on your <laughs> CV. But Mr. Sex is how you'll always be <laughs> beatable, of right. us, I think. <laughs> Thank well, you well I, I, long may I be remembered for Mr. Sex, <laughs> and uh, what a great it was to work with the uh, great Rick Mail and indeed the great Adrian Edmondson. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. You're welcome. Very nice to talk to you all. Likewise. Bye. Bye. Good luck. Cheers. Bye. See ya. Bye.